I would like to invite our first speaker, Yoni Halske, to take it away, please. Hi, my name is Yoni Halske, and I will talk to you about Bayesian inference of nonlinear and non Gaussian state space models in R using Bayes and package. So, what are state space models? State space models are a, are a large class of statistical models, including, for example, structural time series models, ARIMA models, and generalized linear models with time varying coefficients. In general, we have some observations y, from y1 to y capital T, where the subscript denotes time or other ordering variable, and where y at time t follows a conditional distribution gt, where we condition on alpha t. Here, alpha t's are called latent states, which go similarly from 1 to capital T, and they follow transition distribution pt, which gives us the distribution of next state given the current state. Both observations yt and states alpha t can be multivariate, and both of these distributions pt and gt can depend on some hyperparameters theta. And our interest is in the joint posterior distribution of states alpha and parameters theta given our data y. Also, predicting future observations and states, as well as interpolation of missing observations, is straightforward within this SSM setting. But wait, what about KFAS? Some of you might be familiar with this other state space modeling package in R. So, what's the difference with this BSSM then? Well, KFAS was designed from the perspective of maximum likelihood estimation, whereas BSSM leans to Bayesian inference, although maximum likelihood estimation is also possible. Second, BSSM supports wider variety of models, and instead of simple importance sampling, BSSM uses particle filtering, which scales better with the number of time points. BSSM is also easier to maintain and extend in future, but on the other hand, creating models is currently a bit easier using the formula syntax of KFAS. But actually, you can convert KFAS models to BSSM format with the help of function S underscore BSSM, which can be useful when constructing complex models. Bayesian estimation of state space models. So how do you estimate this? There are two special classes of SSMs. First is a case where the distributions of observations and states are both linear Gaussian. And another one is where the states are categorical, but I will not discuss this here because that's not supported by the BSSM. So what is so special about these models is that the marginal likelihood can be computed in an analytically tractable way. For this linear Gaussian case, we can use Kalman filter algorithm, which gives us the marginal likelihood of y given theta. This marginalization of latent states alpha can be used to construct an efficient Markov chain Monte Carlo MCMC algorithm. So what we want to do is to run MCMC targeting only the marginal posterior of hyperparameters theta, and given samples from this marginal posterior, we simulate states from the so-called smoothing distribution, which is the conditional distribution of all the latent states given all the data and current theta. And because theta is often low dimensional, simple adaptive random walk metropolis works typically well. For the Bayesian inference of general state space models, things are more complicated because the marginal likelihood is no longer analytically tractable. Instead, we could consider at least three different options. First would be that we forget the special nature of states and treat the state similarly as thetas, and sample both using some general MCMC machinery provided, for example, by Bux or Stan. Unfortunately, this is often inefficient due to the strong correlation structures and high dimensionality of alpha, the states. Second option is to leverage some approximate methods, such as the Laplace approximations, as in INLA. This is often fast, but biased by construction. Although the bias can often be negligible in practice, it is hard to quantify the amount of bias in specific applications. 
Third option would be to use so-called pseudo-marginal MCMC or particle MCMC methods, where the marginal likelihood is replaced by its unbiased estimator from particle filter. This is asymptotically exact, like the first option, but often computationally heavy, as we need to run particle filter at each MCMC iteration, possibly with a large number of particles. It can also be a bit tricky to tune the MCMC algorithm and define a good number of particles for efficient inference. So I see MCMC for state space models. So what BSSM does is it combines the fast approximations and XX methods by first finding an approximate marginal posterior of thetas and then correcting this with important sampling type weighting. We call this IC ISMCMC method. So first assume that we can compute approximation p hat of the marginal likelihood for a given theta. So then we can run MCMC targeting approximate marginal posterior of theta, where the true likelihood is replaced by its approximation. Then for each theta from this approximate posterior, we run particle filter, which gives us the samples of alphas, states, and unbiased estimate of the likelihood. So in the end, we have a weighted samples from the joint posterior, where weights correspond to the ratio of true and approximate likelihood terms. This works really well for the models supported by for BSSM, but of course, in general, the approximation should be good enough, similar as in typical importance sampling. For the post correction, BSSM uses by default a particle filter called CAPF, which again leverages the approximate model computed earlier, leading to a particle filter which in many cases needs only a few particles, making it computationally efficient. Other particle filters could also be used, for example, basic boots particle filter, which is also, also implemented in BSSM. Note that the post correction needs only be done for each accepted theta independently, so it is trivial to parallelize this efficiently. Okay, so what kind of models BSSM supports? First, we have a linear Gaussian models, where the observations y are a linear combination of states, plus some Gaussian error term and optional intercept term, and similar states depend on the states of the previous time points. Different models can be defined by defining different model components, D, Z, H, C, T, R, A1, and P1. These are vectors, matrices, or arrays, depending on whether we have a univariate or multivariate model, and whether these model components depend on time. Often we know the structure of some of these model components, whereas some of these depend on parameter vector theta. We can build these models with BSSM using several functions. For example, SSM underscore ULG defines general univariate model, and BSM underscore LG can be used to define a structural time series model, where unknown parameters correspond to the standard deviations of the noise terms, as well as possible regression coefficients of the exogenous variables X. non-Gaussian observations. This is another class of models supported by the BS. Here the observations are non-Gaussian, but the states are still linear Gaussian. Model building is similar as in the previous case, we just now have to define the distributions of observations as well. BSSM currently supports Gaussian, Poisson, binomial, negative binomial, and gamma models, and you can have a multivariate models with mixed distribution as well. For these, we use we can use Laplace approximation for efficient approximate inference or exact inference based on the ISMCMC approach. Essentially, we iteratively find a linear Gaussian model which has the same conditional mode of the states as the original model. Here is an example of a simple bivariate Poisson model where we assume that the both time series are generated by the same latent state process alpha. So I'm first simulating some data, and then I define two R functions, which are used within the SSM underscore MNG function, which defines the whole model. So these two R functions, prior fun and update fun, which define the log prior density and how the model components depend on the parameters theta. Even though these are R functions, which are used within the compiled C++ code, we only need to call these functions once per each MCMC iteration, 
So the overhead is more compared to the actual likelihood computations and so on. These functions, together with the definition of the model components, such as Z and T, are then given to the SSM underscore MNG function, which returns the model object usable as an input for other functions of the package. In addition, BSSM also supports two model types, nonlinear models and models where the state equation is defined as a continuous time diffusion. For the nonlinear Gaussian model, the approximation is based on the mode matching similarities in the non Gaussian case, but this time using extended Kalman filter and smoother. An unbiased estimation is possible using particle filter. For models where the state equation is defined as a continuous time diffusion, we assume that we have observations at integer times. Here the approximation is related to the coarseness of the time discretization mesh. So finer the time discretization, more computationally demanding the particle filter is. So we can use coarser approximation in the first phase and then do post correction using the finer mesh. These models are quite general in a way that these nonlinear functions are defined, so we can't use R functions for defining those, as then we would need to go back and forth from R to C within the particle filtering. So instead, users should define their models using small C snippets using the templates provided in the vignettes. Now, as an example, I'll show how to analyze yearly drownings in Finland from 1969 to 2019. We have a data on yearly drownings, which we assume follows Poisson distribution, conditional on the latent level mu, average summer temperature, and yearly population. The latent process mu is assumed to follow random walk with a random slope, and the random slope is again defined as a random walk. So we have three hyperparameters regression coefficient beta and two standard deviation parameters and the latent state vector alpha t contains the level and the slope terms. Estimating this model with the BSSM. We can build this model using BSM underscore ng function where we define our data, the population size exposure, the distribution Poisson and predictor variable summer temperature, and finally some priors. For priors of basic structural model, we can use helper functions normal for regression coefficient and gamma for standard deviations, where we first define the initial value and parameters of the prior. Then we just call function run underscore mcmc with a certain number of iterations and number of particles used in the post correction phase. By default, this uses is mcmc but fully approximate inference is also possible as well as normal particle MCMC methods and its delayed acceptance variant. We then see from the summary of theta that the temperature has a small effect. One degree rise in average summer temperature in Celsius leads to about 10% of more deaths or drownings. And finally, we have a figure of intensity XP mu, number of deaths per 100,000, which shows that the drownings have drastically decreased in recent decades. In 70s, we had around six drownings per year per 100,000, and now only have around two. Thank you for listening. Here are some references. Please check out the package on CRAN if you're interested in state space modeling. Thank you. Thank you, Yanni. Um, I think we have time for a few questions. And if you have any, uh, please type in the q and I already see that one question was answered by Yuni. Uh, I'm not able to ask a question, so I'm going to go ahead and ask this. Um, so you said that the, the categorical variables, you know, which would be here in Markov models and so on, are not supported. So is, are there plans to do so in the future? Uh, not really. Thanks. Yeah. It's a good question. It's, it's sort of a, it's quite different uh, methodology for categorical settings. So. So that, that would sort of need a separate kind of uh, interface. And in a sense, you could do it, but it's, it's slightly different, different problem to how to, how to do those in properly. Although I am doing that kind of thing for another package. So maybe in future, I will, <laughs> I will talk about that then. <laughs> I don't see any more questions typed in the thing, but one more. Um, so uh, I didn't get a chance of how intensive these computations are 
Are you making use of any, you know, any, any, uh, any kind of computation techniques? That are, I mean, of course, it's Bayesian, so some of it is inherently sequential, but any chance for other kinds of parallel computations or anything like that? Sorry, could you repeat? No, is there any, any scope for parallelism or anything like that? Uh, parallelism, yeah, there is, because the, so basically I'm using the OpenMP for, mm -hmm. for parallelizing the, the post-correction phase. So of course for the MCMC, it's hard to parallelize because it's iteratively or sequential, but then the post-correction phase, you can do that in parallel fashion Thank easily. You. Yeah. Thank you. Let's see, I, I think that you're doing well on time. So I think that any, I'll just wait for a, just a few seconds more to see if there are any more questions coming up. Um, and as I said, even the panelists, you know, if you have questions, you have to speak up because I'm not able to type my questions with the QA. So, uh, all right. So I think that thank you very much for your talk. Thank it was you. Very interesting. And uh, our next speaker is Rachel Lucasen, who will be speaking on VM Monitor, checking the robustness and sensitivity of Bayesian networks. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Rachel Wilkerson, and I'm speaking today on a package that I worked on with my colleagues to check uh, some diagnostic monitors for Bayesian networks that check the robustness and sensitivity. So um, if you think about it, when you run a linear regression model, you almost always turn around and then check your residuals and check your diagnostics. But um, often this isn't a common practice when we have Bayes nets. Uh, so our package is designed to make that process easier. And there are two main components of it. Uh, the first is a set of functions that uh, diagnostic monitors that are, can be used in increasing fineness to check the forecasts that flow from a model to check how accurate they are. And these work specifically on Bayes nets that are learned from data. Um, the second set of functions that we have is um, uh, a set sorry, a set of sensitivity functions. And those take the probability distributions that are underpinning your Bayes net and checks the effects of what happens when we change those, how sensitive it is it to those slight changes. And so those monitors work for um, Bayes nets that are learned either from data or from elicitation and their data can be either discrete or continuous. As a motivating example for uh, to showcase our package, we worked with a set of data on from the UCI repository where it's called the Pima Indian data set. It has information on 392 women. Um, it's discretized into binary variables, and this is the information that it has. Um, the number of times the women were pregnant, their plasma glucose concentration, diastolic blood pressure, uh, skin fold thickness, two-hour serum insulin, body mass index, diabetes pedigree function, their age, and ultimately whether or not they tested positive for diabetes. So when we think about our Bayes net, um, we're often sort of looking at this test for diabetes as the outcome variable, um, and we'll test that with our monitors. Uh, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that we chose this data set because it best showcases uh, what our monitors are good for. But I want to acknowledge that I'm using this data without explicit consent of or compensation for the original participants who actually refer to themselves as the ACML odem. Uh, and there's a really fascinating paper by Joanne Radden um, that gets into the ethics of using this data set sort of far removed from the original context in which it was collected. So I um, wanted to take a moment to recognize that. And then with that, I'll dig into our uh, robustness monitors. So the largest um, monitor that we have is the global monitor. And that is um, for, for looking at your network as a whole. So to do that, um, I've looked at two just sample um, Bayes nets that you might do if you fire up the BM learn package and decide to use a hill climbing um, algorithm to find the structure for one. And then I've used a max min hill climbing criterion um, for the model on the right. And then I've come up with these two network structures. And so suppose the global monitor is most useful for determining um, the, the differences between two models. So uh, we just run global monitor. And the only other parameter that we have besides our uh, directed acyclic graph in our data set is, is alpha. And um, that's commonly set as the number of levels for a node in a net data set. So since all of ours were discretized to binary variables here, alpha is two. And then for each vertex, uh, what our global monitor does is it computes the contribution of the um, log likelihood from each node. 
And then you can compare the two nodes and compare, can sort of come up with a base factor per node. Um, the other thing you can use global monitors for is you can use some of the finer nodes that I'll discuss in a minute and then go back and recompute your global monitor to see how it just changed the model as a whole. Uh, the rest of the monitors that we look at from here are really derived from the Prequential uh, framework, which was first developed by Phil David around uh, 92 and refined in some subsequent papers. And those all focus on looking at the quantity PI. So where you're looking for the predictive density from the base net that you took learning from all the previous um, I minus one iterations. So uh, we would learn the whole DAG just based on those and then predict the next thing. And so we can think of the score function that we then take from that as sort of the level of surprise of seeing the next observation. Uh, and so our index j, y sub j indicates um, sums over all the possible values that that particular node can take. Um, so bold y is, would be positive negative, say for our diabetes node. And then uh, here we're looking at the logarithmic score function. Um, there's lots of other score functions that we could have used, um, but here we're just taking sticking to the log score. So when we look at our diabetes example, um, when we think about predicting the next iteration, this is sort of a sample of what our data set looks like. So we might learn on the first nine observations and then try to predict the 10th. Um, so once we have our log score, then we then need to think about standardization. There's two main standardization techniques. The first is um, relative standardization. So um, that works when we just take a ratio of two different quantities like we did for the global monitor. Um, the ones that we'll look at next, I'll use the absolute standardization where we're computing a Z statistic uh, using the following for the expectation of variance. So we take those probabilities that we've looked at um, and then multiply them by the log probabilities and sum over all the possible uh, values Y sub J that, that this could take. And this gives us the expectation value for that next uh, forecast that we're looking at. And then we compute the variance in a similar format and finally, get this uh, sort of test set statistic that um, tells us how, how surprised we are to see each um, e the next observation. So sort of the benchmark that we use here is if you're looking for anything where the absolute value of your Z score is outside 1.96, and that could be an indication of poor model fit. So we'll look at some examples of what this looks like, but that's, um, that's just your, your main hallmark for when you might wanna check out what's going on with your model. When we talk about the sequential framework, that's just derived from, it just means sequential predictions. So um, the first example we have of a sequential node monitor is the, or of a sequential monitor is these node monitors, and they come in two flavors, uh, marginal and conditional. So first we'll look at the conditional, or the marginal node, node monitors, and those check how appropriate each probability distribution is for a given node. Uh, so in our um, our package BN Learn, these are implemented with a uh, seek Marge monitor, and then you just call the name of the node, and it will generate this graph that shows you um, sort of how close it is coming to these sort of treble, treble boundaries indicated. Um, these red dashed lines indicate um, Z is equal to plus or minus 1.96. So we see this monitor is seems to be performing pretty well. It's not coming anywhere close to our, our problem areas. And so um, this, this is for the node diabetes pedigree function, and it looks like a good fit. Um, now we're going to look at our sort of main outcome node of interest, um, the diabetes, whether or not somebody has a positive or negative diabetes test. And when we look at this, we notice that sort of for the later observations, once we hit sort of like mark 300, there, there seems to be some sort of, um, some sort of indication that perhaps the probability distribution isn't as good a fit. Um, and there can be a lot of reasons for this. It may be that there's some sort of underlying dependence that's not captured in the data that's given. Maybe people are coming in to the clinic with their friends and they all have some sort of um, latent traits that aren't uh, clear from, from the data that we've collected. So that's the marginal monitors. The conditional node monitor is very similar, except when they get to that, I, that next observation, YI, they also, pass evidence on all the other variables uh, for that i iteration. Um, and so that can give us another indication of how, how good the um, probability function is. And so here's an example of a node monitor that is uh, giving some issues. Uh, this is uh, modeling pregnancy. And we noticed that it's uh, doing very, very badly for the first half of the data. Um, 
So we might want to unpick that with our finer monitors. So the next monitor that we have sort of goes down another level to figure out what's really happening with that probability distribution. It's called the parent-child monitor. And so uh, this will use the same sort of log score that we're looking at before, except we add this um, extra parameter pi sub j. So that's a specific set of the values of the parent node. Um, and we're going to use the same standardization that we had on our previous slides. So here we're going to dig further into what's happening with that node for pregnancy. And we're using the, the specifically looking at um, age where we're, we're um, where age is low. So for young women, what's what's going on? Um, and so sure enough, our monitors reveal that there's specifically poor forecasts of pregnancy for young women. So uh, that might tell us that there's some sort of, um, it's sort of, you could go back to the study authors at that point and say, why don't we investigate what's happening with young, young women? Um, because this part of our model isn't predicted very well. So that sums up our robustness monitors. And then with that, we turn our attention to the uh, sensitivity functions. So um, those, for those, we take our DAG and then our probability set of conditional probability distributions. And that gives us our model that we're going to call G. And then we can take our nodes and set those into observation and evidence variables, O and E. And our sensitivity functions are going to tell us something about that probability distribution of our entire model um, for our observation, observational variables given our evidence variables. So we want to know um, how, how this overall probability varies once we start tinkering with the conditional probabilities that compose our model. Um, so this question was first posed by Chana Darwish as uh, what changes in the conditional probabilities would make um, the global probability of our observational variables given our evidence equal to this specific value. So uh, we see how that's been implemented in our monitor here. Um, first off, we look in our diabetes example about how does the marginal probability of a positive test depend on the variable that glucose is high. And so our function in BN monitor is called sensitivity. We call our BN um, our BN object and look at our interest node diabetes. And uh, we want to specifically look at positive diabetes tests and high glucose. And uh, then we're going to uh, sort of compare that with our um, what the conditional probability of a positive test is given a low level of insulin. And we want to know how that varies when the probability of a high level of glucose changes. So uh, these are the two plots that we're going to generate here. And when we look at them side by side, um, we see that for both charts, we see that the probability of having a high level of glucose, um, as that goes up, the probability of having a positive test for diabetes is also going to increase. Um, and for the conditional probability chart on the right, the, this increase is very nonlinear. And that's what we expect to see um, from the results of Coupe and Vandergaard. Um, so, the next function that we look at in our sensitivity models is called ZD distance. And uh, with that, we're answering questions like, how do changes in the probability of high glucose affect the overall probability distribution of the BN? And so uh, there's lots of different metrics for this, but specifically for this, we're interested in a metric for, called the CD distance. Um, and we've implemented it with the function CD. And when we do that, then um, we, it, it gives us our, our plots and we see that um, overall the CD distance is smaller for changes conditioned on high BMI and high glucose comparatively. Um, so that tells us, um, that enables us to measure the distance between our um, probability distributions. And sort of the last function, the last main function that's in our uh, sensitivity uh, package looks at the probability or answers questions like, um, what, uh, sorry, so we have the, we want to know what the probability of positive diabetes tests is and we have high blood pressure. And so uh, we can do this from the grain package just by using the query grain function. And this generates this chart um, that shows us what those probabilities are. Um, but suppose then we take this back to our experts, they look at this and they say, um, actually, we think this probability that's 
0.3814 down in the corner should be at least 0.4. We might want to know what would need to happen to the um, probability distributions to, to bump that up. What effect is that going to have on our global model? Um, so what configurations of conditional probabilities will make this possible? So our, our function that we introduce here is called sense query. And uh, what that does, we go and we specify the specific uh, like n values that we want our, our model to take. And then uh, what sense query does is it runs all the possibilities and returns the, the, the settings that would need to happen um, for this to be the case. So this gives us all the plausible scenarios. So that's what I have. Um, thank you to my co-authors who did all the sensitivity functions, Manuel Leonelli at um, IE University in Madrid and Ramsey Ramanathan, who I believe just graduated with her MSc from Bologna. So um, that's what I have today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was quite interesting. I I'm just looking to, at the chat to see if there's any, or the q &A to see if there are any questions. And I don't see any, but I, I had one. If you, uh, I don't recall that you mentioned something about elicitation. So is there any kind of, uh, in any of these examples, was there any kind of prior elicitation or anything like that? I mean, I'm, maybe I misheard. Um, no, this, this um, we mostly looked at the, use the diabetes data set just because it was available. Um, but I have worked with some elicitation data. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, in any, for the for the robustness monitors, you need some sort of online data and online setting and some data coming in where you can check it, but you could use the original elicitation probabilities. Um, and for the sensitivity stuff, yeah, you could just use those. All you need is the um, conditional probabilities and then you can plug those in and see, see how that works. So you did I answer the question? It was, um, we didn't use that for the specific example, but you could. Thank you. Yuni, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I was going to ask about the, the ordering of the variables. In, I understand if you have kind of sequence of data coming in, but if you sort of have this static data, this, is, this uh, diabetes example, how does your these robustness checks depend on the ordering of the variable if you are just looking at the right. first eye? Yeah. It's, um... It, it does, it matters quite a lot, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think it's, um, yeah, that's that's kind of where the nuances, that's where, honestly, it was, it was sort of hard to find an example because so many of the ones where people are in the end, they're all um, sort of synthesized or something, right? And so you don't get this sort of, what like what you get in real life where there's like weird, people come in with their friends or some, some sort yeah, of yeah. line order. Yeah. The other thing you can do with these though, where I don't show that here, but you can take some sort of covariate and order them according to the covariate. And then um, that would give you sort of an extra way to sort of figure out yeah. where it's going wrong. Um, yeah. Good. Thanks. Any further questions? We're doing well on time. And of course, just a reminder that the, panelists will come back together in the end as well and uh, for further questions. So please do not be shy about asking questions. I think so far I'm pleased that there's some questions being asked of the speaker and uh, thank you, Rachel. And so I will move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Vittorio Dominic Orlandi from Duke University and he'll be speaking on FLAME, which is an interpretable matching for causal inference. Go ahead. So yeah, hi everybody, I'm Vittorio. Uh, I'll be talking about this package Flame that does interpretable matching for causal inference. Uh, this is joint work with the Almost Matching Exactly or AME lab at Duke University. So let's get started. So causal inference uh, seeks to quantify the effect of some treatment, which here I'll take to be binary uh, on some outcome Y. Uh, and one way of framing the problem is to consider two potential outcomes for each unit I, YI of one, which denotes the outcome under treatment, and yi of zero, which denotes it under control. Now, crucially, only one of these uh, is actually observed because you can't both be treated and not treated. Uh, the other, which we call the counterfactual, has to be estimated from the data. Now, this can be a little complicated when you have observational data because your covariates might be confounders. So uh, pretend that you have, um, you're trying to figure out the effect of some drug 
whether or not you receive the drug, that's the treatment, on some health outcome. Um, it might be the case that people that are sicker in general, as captured by the covariates, are more likely to take the drug, right? So a naive analysis might conclude that the drug is actually harmful, um, but actually it's just that you have this kind of uh, selection issue, which is biasing your, your effects. So you need to adjust for this somehow, and one approach to doing so um, is called matching. So to start thinking about this, let's imagine that we have a treated unit I, and in our data set, we can find a control unit K that has identical covariate values. You know, it's an identical twin. Well, then intuitively, YK, which is the observed response of unit K, uh, is a really good estimate of the unobserved counterfactual of unit I, right? Because they're identical in their covariates, you expect that K looks a lot like what I would have had they not been treated. So this would be great if we could find units like this. Um, but exact matches in, in high dimensional settings are, are quite unlikely. Uh, as a side note, they're impossible whenever you have continuous covariates, but that's not something I'll talk about here. Uh, and so we're gonna have to settle for some sort of approximate equality. So now the question is, how, how do we determine when units are close enough to match? And our approach to this uh, takes the form of an optimization problem. We call our approach almost matching exactly. And uh, we'll unpack this bit by bit, starting with the second line. Uh, so given a unit I, we're going to find units K that may not match exactly on all the covariates, but match exactly on a subset of covariates that's selected by theta. So theta is a binary vector uh, of zeros and ones, with zeros where you're not enforcing exact matches, and ones where you are. So this circle here uh, denotes an element-wise or Hadamard product. Right? Okay, so you're finding units that match exactly on a subset of the covariates, uh, and also that have uh, opposite treatment, because you're trying to estimate counterfactuals. And out of the many thetas that you might uh, be able to find that satisfy this, we're going to choose the one that corresponds to the highest importance covariate set, where uh, importance is determined by these covariate weights, W. And so implicitly, what we're doing by solving this problem is defining a distance metric uh, that determines when units are close enough to match, and it, one prioritizes matches on relevant covariates uh, through W. This ensures that, you know, in a medical example, maybe we don't match on hair color at the expense of matching on something much more medically relevant like sex. And in addition, it matches exactly when possible, which kind of gets us closer to the gold standard of finding identical twins in the data that I was discussing on the past slide. And so in practice, what's going to happen is we're going to iterate over covariate sets, over these thetas starting with more important ones. Um, we're going to take a theta, we're going to match units, any possible units exactly on those covariates, then we're going to choose another one, match any remaining units exactly, and, and kind of iterate until stopping. And our algorithms are just telling you how precisely to do that iteration. So the first algorithm is called DAME, and it solves the AME problem on the previous slide exactly for each unit. So it will give you the highest quality uh, covariate subset for each unit that uh, you can find matches on. And even though there's two to the p possible covariate subsets, there's an efficient solution uh, via a property called downward closure. And this essentially tells you that you can search the space uh, in a smart way. So you're going to start with the best possible uh, covariate vector, which is a theta of all ones, denoting exact matching. And then you're going to go to the next most important covariate vector, and then the next most. And so as soon as you find a match for some unit, because you're searching in this order, it's guaranteed to be the best possible match. Flame uh, approximates the solution found by Dame via a backward stepwise selection procedure. Uh, so at each iteration, you eliminate an entire covariate. Um, that is, the first iteration, you try and match exactly on all the covariates. Then you ignore the least important one, match on the remaining ones, and, and keep going. Now, in practice, uh, no one gives you a nice little covariate vector uh, describing the importances of, of your variables in your data set. And so what we do is we run a machine learning algorithm on a separate holdout set of data that we're not going to match. And whenever we're trying to consider a, a, a theta, a vector of covariates, we're going to compute its predictive error, its PE, which is the error in using that covariate set to predict an outcome. And this determines the next covariate set to match on, right? We're going to choose the theta that essentially yields the lowest predictive error. Okay, so onto the package. Um, the 
The package implements uh, these two algorithms, flame and dame, in the functions, flame and dame. Uh, they match input data under a wide variety of specifications, some of which I'll go over here. And they call efficient bit vectors routines for making matches, so you're not doing something really slow, uh, like iterate or like looping over units and covariates when you're trying to find matches. Uh, they return S3 objects of class A and E for almost matching exactly uh, with print plot and summary methods that I'll discuss. Installation is, is standard. Uh, I just want to point out that there's two different uh, GitHub links out in the wild. One is a mirror of the other, so you don't have to be worried if, if you see multiple or anything like that. They're both OK. And so to illustrate uh, the package, I'm going to look at the, um, some data put out by NCHS in 2010, which is data on neonatal health outcomes in the NICU. And in particular, we're going to look at the problem study by Pandraki in 2020 uh, on the effect of extreme smoking on birth weight. And extreme smoking is defined as uh, the mother smoking at least 10 cigarettes per day throughout her pregnancy. Uh, in this analysis, I'm going to look at a subset of half a million observations. Uh, I'm going to use all the covariate information, though, which includes the sex of the infant, the races of the parents, uh, previous cesarean deliveries, and, and others. And if you download this data set onto your computer, the first thing that you're going to notice is there's a lot of missing data. And when you're trying to match, you need to decide what you're going to do with it. So there's a missing data argument to flame and dame, which uh, tells you what you do with missingness in the data that you want to match. So there's three options. Uh, the first, and maybe the most obvious, is just to drop the, the units with missingness. If you're missing anything, you're not going to match that unit. The second uh, imputes the missing values via mice and then matches on the completed data set. And the third keep, keeps missing values in the data but doesn't allow for matches on them. So two units are only going to match on a covariate set if neither of them has any missing values uh, for any of those covariates. And then there's an analogous argument for dealing with missingness in the holdout data set, uh, which used to compute predictive error. And speaking of computing predictive error, um, this is a very important part of the algorithm because this determines your covariate importances, which determines the covariate subsets that you match on and ultimately affects uh, the matches that you make. So there's two implemented options for, commu for computing PE. Uh, ridge regression uh, via GLMnet with cross-validation to choose the regularization parameter and um, gradient boosting via XGBoost to, with cross-validation to choose a variety of other parameters. But you can also supply your own function um, if you think it's better suited to the data that you have at hand, or uh, you, know, you maybe you want something faster that doesn't do as much cross-validation. And uh, there's details on how to write these you know, in the docs and stuff, but this is just a function that's going to use a, a linear model uh, in order to compute predictive error. And so we can put some of these pieces together uh, to show a full call um, to flame to match the natality data. Uh, calling dame is you know, identical. You just use that function instead. Um, and so just going briefly through this bit by bit, uh, in the data argument, we pass the data to be matched, which here I've already loaded into a data frame uh, called natality. You can pass a separate holdout set to compute predictive error, or you can supply a, pro a proportion uh, of the data from the matching data that will be taken uh, and used to compute the error. And that's not matched, so you're not double dipping or anything. Uh, and you can decide whether to match with or without replacement, uh, specify the names of, of the treatment and outcome, how you want to deal with missing data if it's present, compute predictive error. And lastly, um, this is a flag that's telling you to estimate conditional average treatment effects, or CATES, as you do the matching. So a CATE is essentially the effect of the treatment on a subset of the population, like on, on certain units that have certain covariate values. And so as I mentioned, uh, once you run this, you're going to get an object of class AME. Uh, when you print it, you just get some information about the number of matches made, uh, an estimated treatment effect. Uh, here, we have that the estimated treatment effect uh, is around negative 180. This is grams, so that corresponds to around negative 6 ounces. So as expected, the effect of extreme smoking on birth weight is negative. Um, and then there's uh, some, some details about how missing this, if present in the data, was handled. There's a plot method, which uh, comes up with one of four plots. Uh, the first one shows the number of covariates that different units matched on. So here we see that the overwhelming number of covariates actually ma uh, of units matched exactly on all covariates, um, which is great because 
matching on more covariates means that the matches are higher quality. Uh, we might be concerned if the majority were only matched on five covariates or something, if, if those were not very useful for predicting the outcome. The second plot plots the estimated conditional average treatment effects uh, against the size of the corresponding match group. So a match group is just the set of all the units that are matched to each other, essentially. Uh, so larger match groups have more stable Kate estimates. So this can be useful uh, to see if you know, larger match groups have systematically different estimates. The third plot is an estimated density plot of the Kate estimates. Um, here, it's nice and unimodal and symmetric, but in cases where uh, there's skew or multimodality, that suggests that there might be subpopulations in your data that are experiencing a heterogeneous treatment effect. Uh, and those can be important to kind of follow up on and, and study in a little bit more detail. Uh, and lastly, we have a heat map of the covariates that are dropped at different iterations. So at iteration one, uh, it's blank because we match on all covariates on iteration two. We don't match on pre-pregnancy hypertension, and uh, so on and so forth. So the variables that uh, kind of are blanked last, uh, such as mother's race here, are those determined to be more important for predicting the outcome by the method used to compute predictive error. Um, you also have a summary method, which gives you additional information on numbers of units matched, average treatment effects. Uh, and some information about match groups, including uh, high quality examples. So quality here is determined by uh, units that match on a lot of covariates, and then on uh, units that have large match groups. And so we can visualize uh, one of these using the mg function, which takes at minimum two arguments the uh, unit whose match group you want, which I'm here taking from the summary object, and then just the object of class AME. And if we look at the match group, we see kind of unsurprisingly that like everything is the same. Uh, all the covariates are the same. And I did show you that lots of the units matched exactly. Um, so this may be a little underwhelming, but other matching methods actually don't guarantee that you match units that are similar in their covariate values. And that's really what makes this method interpretable and is really important because the fact that we are grouping these units together is the basis for our estimating a treatment effect to be what it is. So you can you know, show a match group to a domain expert, and then it's very easy for them to confirm that, yes, these units really are similar in meaningful ways, and it's OK to estimate a treatment effect based off of them. So just to wrap up, uh, Flame and Dame are scalable algorithms for observational causal inference. Um, they use machine learning on a holdout set to learn a distance metric that prioritizes matches on more important covariates. Uh, and the resulting match groups are interpretable because they're made, uh, matches are made directly on covariate values, and they're high quality because those covariates are ones that are more important uh, for the outcome. Future work in the package is going to focus on the database implementation. Um, Flame is pretty scalable. Like I said, I ran it on this data set with half a million observations, but the full data set uh, doesn't fit in memory, so the database implementation will handle that. And then algorithms for mixed, continuous, and discrete data. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. Here's a you know link to the web page and a QR code for the same thing. Uh, you can find the papers, the links to the GitHub, uh, user guides, and things like that. If you or collaborators are more comfortable in R, or sorry, in Python or Stata, uh, there's packages for that, uh, and a lot of other good information uh, of that sort. And uh, yeah, just to conclude, I want to say that. We came up with these methods because we think that they can be really useful uh, for you know, individuals in a wide variety of fields, analyzing their own data, analyzing interesting effects of certain treatments on certain outcomes. Uh, and so we'd love it if you use the packages. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me. If you don't have any questions, but you're still using it, also feel free to reach out to me. Um, and yeah, thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Antonio. Um... I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Uh, oh, there is, there is one. OK, good. Let's see that now. So Christoph asks, why the two arguments, missing data and missing holdout, can they be different? Yeah, so they can be different. Um, so uh, missing data corresponds to how you deal with missingness in the data that you're going to match, uh, and missing holdout handles missing this in the data that you're going to use to compute covariate importance or predictive error. So as an example of, of why they might be different, um, well, first of all, you can't, you don't have the option for keeping the missing values. 
uh, in the holdout data set because you need to run some sort of regression on it. Um, but even otherwise, I mean, maybe, um, maybe you really don't want to drop missing units in the match data because you really f find it crucial to match as many units possible. Um, and so you're going to impute them or something, but you're pretty confident that a smaller subset of your data is sufficient for estimating the outcome well in the holdout set. And so you drop those units for, for um, computationally efficient reasons. Um, so there's different reasons why you might have them be different, but one corresponds to how you deal with missingness in the data to be matched, and one with how you deal with missingness in the data that you use to compute covariate importance. Uh, I'll just make a comment that uh, often I have to do, you know, I do some you know, propensity score matching and things like that. And so it'd be interesting to see how this, this algorithm can be sort of applied there to see what kind of matches it gives compared to others. I've seen, used other things, other packages in the past. So I, I'm, I'm really curious to check this out. <laughs> yeah, you should definitely check out the papers. I'm of course very biased, um, but there's, I think some very compelling simulations on how this can do compared to methods like propensity score matching. Um, and even if, you know, propensity score matching does have nice theoretical properties, uh, but the fact is that if you do look at some of the match groups, you are matching together units that look wildly different. There's nothing in propensity score matching that prevents you when you're trying to determine some sort of medical uh, treatment effect from matching together a 20 year old and an 80 year old. Um, that might be totally fine, even if a doctor you know, would never say, oh yeah, these units are similar, so I'm going to kind of compare them in order to estimate a treatment. So yeah, it's a, it's a nice feature of our method. Yeah, and also I think that often the when you do a match, it'd be nice to see exactly what was matched on. So you actually print out those things. So that's actually very useful because uh, it almost seems like a basic step, but sometimes you know you go, it gets, goes out in the wash a little bit sometimes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And I, I want to say that I think all of you have done wonderfully in terms of time. So I re really have made my job a lot easier. Uh, just wait a second more to see if there's any uh, question or anything like that. Um, um, okay, now I forget whether the panel happens now or is it after the sponsor talk? I don't know. <laughs> I think it happens after the sponsor talk, I think. So uh, I'll go ahead and then introduce our next speaker, who is Mehar Pratap Singh. And he is the, if I'm not mistaken, the CEO of Prokogia. And they've been a big supporter of uh, our consortium, which has done wonderful work for in supporting our activities. So, uh, of course, I, as I use our you know, participant, thank you for their sponsorship. And so, we'll go ahead. And I think his video, he's going to have a video presentation. I think so. Can we go ahead, please? Hello, everyone. I hope you have enjoyed the conference and are ready for the weekend as the conference comes to a close. Uh, I sure have enjoyed the talks. A brief introduction about me. I am the founder and the CEO of Procagia. We are a data science consulting company heavily involved in the R community. I also sit on the R consortium board as well as the infrastructure steering committee. Um, I will be talking about the work that our consortium is doing, how we are being the invisible hand in the community and helping to connect the dots. Uh, I would also like to share uh, why I decided to join the our consortium. Um, our consortium fulfills a unique need in the growing data science space. Our language resources are critical tools in the data-driven economy. But where to find the resources? Which ones are best to leverage? And which needs strategic support and funding? That's where we have stepped in. But let me also talk about how we do it. As you can see, at the ground level, we have an infrastructure steering committee, a marketing committee, and working groups. Our consortium sits under the umbrella of the Linux Foundation. It's governed by the board that consists of the representatives of the member organizations. Ultimately, our consortium is here to support the R community and promote, develop, and extend the reach of R.
And while we are talking about members, our members, leading institutions, and companies are dedicated to the use, develop, and growth of R. They are working with us together to ensure the future of R, and we couldn't be prouder. Let us take a moment and think why they choose to do so. Strategic funding of R is not something that individuals can do no matter how capable. And it's not possible for shareholder beholden corporations either. That is why the vendor neutral open governance R consortium has continued to be supported by our members over the years. And if you happen to be one of the a part of the organizations, we thank you very much for the support. From a high level view, you can see some of the big ways we are involved in the R community. R consortium grants to R infrastructure projects, R repositories, R specialists, R events, and R communities, not just locally, but worldwide. And so far we have invested more than $1 million into all these various initiatives. These funds support projects from small conferences and R development to large scale projects such as the R Validation Hub. And I'm also sure that each one of you has experienced the work that we are supporting either as part of our ladies group or the our user group or some other form that has been a brainchild of the consortium. We foster the community, the R meetings and those gatherings. This past year was a hard year by any measure. And the fact that we are not meeting in person and are talking virtually is a testament to that. Companies struggle to find a way to move forward during a global pandemic. Our open source governance and foundation model has been uniquely positioned to benefit the worldwide community of users, maintainers, and developers of our software. As an example, are continued to shine as a tool to effectively map and organize data on COVID. You can see these activities and projects that are on the screen. These activities and project are run by various parts of the R consortium. Some are run by the Infrastructure Steering Committee, ISC, that evaluates funds and manages individuals as well as team technical projects. A marketing committee that helps us identify, organize and support various events where we can collaborate over common objectives and initiatives. In addition, we also operate via working groups which consist of members as well as non-members that help us run top level projects. And I will be giving examples for all of these shortly, but let me stop here and take a pause and talk about two examples that are being used heavily day in, day out by all of us. The first one is the package DBI. The first grant, few grants that our consortium made went to DBI project, which was run by Kirill Mueller to improve the R database interfaces. The DBI project and resulting eponymous R package substantially improved our low level connectivity to several databases, including R Postgres, R MariaDB, R SQLite, ODBC, Big R query and several other database backends. The impetus behind the project has been a long-term effort from the project to do distributed statistical computing. And the second example that I want to talk about is the R hub. The initial infrastructure that was put in place into R consortium was primarily done with the idea of R hub in mind. 
It is a collection of services to facilitate our package development. It has become ubiquitous now. It is free for all members of the community. The most prominent servicer, the R Hub Builder, complements the services offered by CRAN by allowing R package builders to check their packages on several platforms against multiple versions of R. Additionally, it allows package developers to build their package binaries and the binaries for all source dependencies on several platforms and R versions. And these are some of the examples that how ISC has helped and we have come together as a community to achieve so much. Um, here I show you a small sample of the projects that uh, we funded in 2020. And this is an example of uh, the projects that we are funding right now in 2021. And I'm pretty sure that just like we talked about DBI and our hub, we might be talking about some of these projects in the future. Now coming over to working groups, uh, one example that is very dear to me and I'm closely involved is around farmer related working groups and how holistically we are trying to solve the pharma industry's problems. And uh, just to showcase how we organize, we are currently working with government agencies like FDA on the top and providing a vendor and a company neutral environment, but at the same time, collaborating and cultivating industry-wide initiatives. And you are more than welcome to be part of these working groups. If your company is part of the, our consortium, great. Even if it's not, we welcome all. And also let's talk about a more detailed view of the working groups. They are all working in tandem towards the common goal of developing R for activities in pharma, how we nourish R for activities in pharma. And those initiatives range from IT to infrastructure, to compliance, to training and education, all working coherently, all working cohesively towards the holistic goal of how we can make R more successful in the pharma world. I hope this gives you a window of the work being done by the R Consortium as we support the growth of R uh, with the ISC examples, with the working group examples, and of course, the fact that we are here, uh, our Consortium is one of the sponsors for this USAR conference as well. Now that you know about who, what, and why of our consortium, let us also talk about the dots, the various dots that we need your help to connect with. And in my mind, the dot for any community has a few characteristics. The first one I would say, the community is organized around a common goal. And we all know how strong the R community is, how aligned the R community is and how we collectively want the success of our language. Second one I would say is members interact frequently. The events, the local events and various forums allow us to engage and interact very closely. Third one, I would say that the members contribute towards the common good. The various working groups, the various ISC projects, the various conferences, provide us a platform to work towards those common goals. And lastly, but not the least, I would say the community really recognizes those contributions. We really appreciate all the hard work that is being done by the volunteers in the consortium. The events, the working groups, all of them, we really appreciate it. And last but not the least, you know, this user organizing committee and all the volunteers have helped us do this, you know, virtually, they deserve an applause. Now let us also talk about you. How can you help us? 
You can help us by joining the R Consortium. Uh, you can also help us by asking your organizations and companies to join, be it your university, be it your college, be it uh, uh, the place that you work at. Please help us by joining and supporting us. This allows you to further demonstrate your LVL, uh, yours as well as their commitment and contribution to the R community. So let's become friends, follow us, reach out to us, contact us, you know, through LinkedIn, through Twitter, through the website. I really look forward to connecting with you. And I also look forward to meeting you guys in person next year. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I think at this point, we are all, all the panelists are going to be available for any further questions that the group may have. Um, by the way, I also wanted to add my thanks at this point to the use our organizers and all the people behind the scenes who have done tremendous work. I, I know, I don't know whether they've slept. So, <laughs> and uh, Steve, I looked at Steven's uh, checklist, for example, and I told him, I don't know how you can keep this up. It's unbelievable how many things he's doing at the same time. So I want to have add my thank you to all of them. And with that, um, I also open the, the floor up to questions for others. Uh, actually, I had one question for Meher Pratap, which is, do you have any, do we have any statistics on our hub usage? For example, I know that it's gone up tremendously. And for, for example, it's never clear, for example, how many VMs are allocated to it, how many, how, how much of the cloud resources are being used, et cetera, et cetera. Like, it'd be nice to have some, some statistics on that so people know numerically what's happening and how many packages are checked today. Um, unfortunately, I don't. I don't have an answer. Um, but I can get back to you on it. All right. So... Um, I think at this point, I also wanted to mention, and I put it in my chat, in the chat, that we have a Slack channel where you can continue the discussions with the speakers and uh, also on other topics. It's called talk underscore stats underscore data underscore analysis underscore two. And it's a channel in the Slack uh, use our 2021 lounge, for example, you can add your channel and continue your discussions there. Uh, well, I think that I also wanted to uh, uh, say one thing too, which is thank all the speakers. I, I think that you made my lot. I was worried a little bit how this was gonna go, but you all made it very easy for me. So thank you very much for excellent talks and I enjoyed it very much. <laughs>